said, I'm Tambet Matisse and I'm from the University of Tartu and I'm leading the self-driving lab or autonomous driving lab here. And maybe I will start with a few words of uh, our lab. Our lab was uh, founded in 2019 uh, together with a ride-hailing unicorn from Estonia, Polt. Maybe you know them, maybe you have even taken the taxi in Estonia with them. Uh, and this is a cooperation project be between the University of Tartu and Polt. And the general goals of the project were first to evaluate the technology readiness uh, for commercialization of the robot taxi or self-driving taxi. Uh, instead of creating an internal division for this, Polt decided to outsource this research into, to the university. Uh, for the university to keep track of what is going on in this area and whether it's uh, ready enough to be commercialized. Secondly, we wanted to create a center of excellence or center of uh, knowledge here in Tartu University uh, where the self-driving research will happen. And finally, the last but not least, uh, we want to prepare the workforce for the uh, autonomous driving companies uh, in Estonia. So we educate the students and try to involve the students in everything we do. And uh, the goal that we have uh, taken for us right now uh, is to drive anywhere in Tartu uh, with 90% uh, of the distance driven autonomously by 2026. So we have a couple of years still to go. Uh, but uh, this is our goal. Uh, of course, uh, this 90% of uh, distance-driven autonomy, auto autonomously, that gives us a little bit of leeway to, to, to still uh, drive parts of the route uh, by uh, humans. But still, we want to drive 90% of the distance autonomously with the car. And by the way, uh, uh, the Bolt also helped us to acquire this uh, Lexus SUV that we use in our uh, lab uh, to actually drive on the streets. So what do we think, what do we need to be able to do that? Uh, so we think we need uh, at least three things from the infrastructure side. There are many other things uh, from the technology side, but from the infrastructure side. We need a high-definition map of Tartu, uh, and I will talk uh, about what is high-definition map. Uh, uh, whatever Elon Musk tells you, I, I'm convinced that at this point of time, uh, the current generation of self-driving cars, if you want to use them commercially to provide a commercial service, you need some kind of map uh, uh, to do that and uh, you need some reliability, some predictability from the car, and that's something you can achieve with the map. Second, I think uh, we need a digital twin of the whole Tartu, because we want to test the vehicle uh, fully before we put it on the streets. So, and the best way to conduct this testing is the simulation. And finally, we believe that we need uh, machine-readable traffic lights in the whole Tartu, uh, this is another thing. We have uh, experienced that uh, detecting the traffic lights from uh, just the video signal al alone is not enough. So to achieve the required safety and reliability, we need to make those traffic lights uh, machine readable. But for today's talk, I would like to focus on the first two, the high definition map and the digital twin. And uh, let's move on. So the first thing uh, we need uh, to drive around in whole Tartu autonomously is high definition map. Uh, what is really the high definition map? What do we call the high definition map? There are multiple different definitions, um, but what we in our lab uh, mean by high definition map is the kind of uh, map, uh, lane level map of the streets. So what you usually get uh, from OpenStreetMap or Google Maps is a uh, uh, road map, uh, the road level map. But what we are aiming for is a lane level map and lane graph, basically. So you can plan your route from any point A to point B uh, using this lane graph. And this lane graph is just not, it's not just lanes. You can also annotate with the uh, average speed on that section, or should you... Um, should your blinker be on in that section or many other things you can attach to those uh, lanes. 
So we want to create this high definition map and, uh, for the whole Tarto and manually annotating this at this detail level. Uh, you see this is one of the intersections in Tarto. At this detail level, it's not feasible to, do, to annotate it manually. So we try to make use of open data as much as possible. And uh, I would like to go with, uh, go with you through the different data sources that we use to create those maps. The very first thing, this is uh, roughly the list of the concepts we have in our data set. Uh, the very first thing is lanes or center lines uh, along which the, the car drives. These currently, in a current state, uh, are uh, manually collected or self-collected using our car. We have a very precise GPS on the car uh, that is using the uh, ESTPOS RTK service from the Estonian land port. And we get decimeter level uh, accuracy with this. And uh, basically, we just collect trajectories of the car and uh, doing some, some automated and some manual post-processing, we turn those into the lane networks. This is the very first step in uh, what we do. Uh, the second thing is uh, road boundaries that we need uh, for our maps. Uh, turns out uh, Tartu City has a nice uh, open data set uh, uh, for uh, snow plow areas. And these uh, snow plow areas more or less uh, coincide with our road boundaries. So we use that area, that data set uh, for the road boundaries. For the lane markings, for example, if the uh, lane marking is, is it solid or attached, uh, this is not currently in any data set. We do it manually based on uh, orthophotos that we also get from the Estonian land board. Uh, in future, we hope to do it using machine learning, uh, using some kind of machine learning models on the same um, orthophotos. We have done some experiments with this, but it's not good yet enough to be practically usable. Stop lines, uh, turns out, again, uh, Tartu City has a nice data set of road markings. We make use of that, and we get our stop lines uh, from there. And pedestrian crossings, again, the same uh, Tartu City road markings uh, data set. Uh, we can use that uh, to create, basically, one-to-one uh, -one use the pedestrian crossings annotated there. And uh, then going to traffic signs, like there's uh, one little giveaway sign here, yeah, you might notice. Uh, so the, we don't use that much traffic signs in our autonomy software, actually, because most of the things, for example, what is the speed uh, limit on that section? These are attributes of the lanes. We, we don't need the traffic sign location or, or um, information for that. So we uh, don't use the traffic signs too much, only for things like giveaway, and, uh, and that's one example here. There is no good data set for that. We have looked into mapillary, uh, but the mapillary data set seemed too noisy for us, at least in Tarto, uh, so we can't really use that. And finally, traffic lights. Again, uh, this is something we... Uh, currently manually uh, position them from the orthophotos. You might see some uh, traffic light uh, little signs here, here, here. And, uh, and we, we need a very precise 3D location of all those traffic lights. Uh, we combine this orthophoto information with uh, LiDAR scans that we have done ourselves with our car. And uh, this is how we position the traffic lights. But one thing I would like to mention is that the traffic lights, positioning of the traffic lights alone is not enough. What is really interesting for us is the association between the traffic light and the stop line. Uh, because it might seem obvious for you that which traffic light applies to which lane. But uh, for the machine, it's not so obvious. And teaching it is challenging at it, and it can make mistakes. And therefore, to achieve the desired safety and reliability, we mark these things on the map. Uh, so which uh, traffic light matches to which stop line. Uh, yeah, these annotations, uh, I have no awareness of any data set that contains these uh, annotations. And we have asked uh, Tartu City to, to start annotating those. Uh, 
And for all of this, uh, we are using uh, uh, mainly two softwares. The QGIS is the one uh, that we use uh, for annotating and uh, filtering and managing all the software. And uh, our uh, um, HDMAP database is set up such a way that uh, there is one universal data set database and we generate different uh, HDMAP formats like there are different formats, for example, LaneLat2, OpenDrive, and so on. We generate from that common database different, uh, different uh, HDMAP formats. And there we are making extensive use of the Shapely uh, uh, package in Python. And the current state, we have uh, mapped uh, 248 uh, kilometers of lanes, uh, 50 bus stops, uh, 106 uh, pedestrian crossings, so on. Uh, but we estimate uh, in Tartu to be uh, 1,500 uh, kilometers of lanes. Uh, we are working towards that. We hope to get finished by the end of this year. Uh, and yes, this uh, bus stops and pedestrian crossings does, doesn't reflect all the things that are in the data set, but these are just the things that are on those lanes that we have mapped. The actual number can be bigger. And this map that we have mapped so far, uh, not all of it, but uh, some part of it is available also on our homepage if somebody wants to take a look in LaneLet 2 and in OpenDrive format. Anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, this was the high definition map. Uh, now the digital twin, the second part of the, our plan that we want to test in the simulation first. Again, I would like to go through the steps how we create this uh, digital twin and, uh, and what kind of data sources and what kind of tools we use uh, as part of the process. So the very first step in the uh, creation of the digital twin of Tartu is uh, creation of the road network. And for this road network, uh, the source, the main source for us is OpenStreetMap. Um, we import the OpenStreetMap into a software called Roadrunner. A Roadrunner is now is a commercial software. It's uh, now part of uh, MathWorks, uh, well known for MATLAB. So if you know MATLAB, then Roadrunner is part of the same package now. Uh, and it's uh, the best software, to our, to our knowledge, uh, for a... Um, spatial modeling of uh, virtual worlds, especially if these are matches to some actual real world uh, situation. Okay, so we import those uh, roads, we get the road network, and we let the Roadrunner build like the 3D uh, model of this uh, road network. This, uh, you might think that it's easy, uh, you just use OpenStreetMap, but it's not. Uh, the root geometry once, uh, what, that we import from the OpenStreetMap looks roughly like this. But the actual geometry of the intersection looks something like this. So the OpenStreetMap obviously doesn't have the detailed information of the road geometry. And it has some uh, information about the number of lanes for each road. And, uh, and what Roadrunner does, it just uh, assigns a fixed width for each lane. But other than that, it's uh, pretty basic. And so it needs a lot of uh, post-processing uh, to get uh, uh, like a real good results. Uh, we do some of that manually, some of that we just leave because we uh, achieve this uh, uh, road markings and everything in a different way using te textures that I will show later. But anyway, we have the road network. The second step is creation of the ground. So we have the roads and we fill the area between the roads with a um, uh, ground using the Estonian Landport Elevation Map. Again, Estonian Landport has been a very good source of different data for us. Uh, and uh, here it comes really useful. Something uh, might be worth uh, noting that we could also skip the, the road creation step and import the elevation map directly. The problem with what happens then is that uh, the road surface might not be completely even when we start from the elevation map. 
if we uh, import the road network first, then the road runner, how it behaves, it creates a flat surface for the roads, and then we fill the area in between the roads using the elevation map, and that can be any shape, but at least our roads have a flat surface. That's one of the reasons why we start from the road network. Now, the next thing is creation of the buildings. Um, uh, luckily, again, Estonian Land Board has a data set of 3D buildings. These are those uh, blocky uh, cubes uh, that have been uh, generated automatically from the LiDAR scans that uh, Estonian Land Board does. Uh, and, uh, and more or less, uh, they look okay. The, even the roof is somewhat has the right shape. But other than that, uh, they are quite blocky. And, what, and uh, the thing, what we do next is, well, by the way, uh, for those things, uh, we do some pre-processing in Blender to achieve the, the right shape and the right positioning. But then uh, we use uh, Metashape, another commercial software, to texture uh, those cubes. And uh, so in the end, it looks something like this. It's not perfect, but it's fast. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we don't use the full-blown photogrammetry. Uh, because we want the result to be uh, running real time, so that we can uh, run our simulations possibly even faster than uh, real time. That's why we resort to those uh, blocky buildings and uh, very simplistic uh, geometrics, geometries. Uh, because we want to achieve that uh, performance. And finally, we add some vegetation and street lights. Again, Estonia Landports has a very nice uh, tree database uh, of all the trees in Estonia, uh, created from the, automatically from the LiDAR scans. And uh, we mix that with uh, Tartu street lights, bus stops, trash containers, some data sets that the Tartu city has. And we need to do a lot of filtering to exclude the street lights and trees from the roads and so on. And, uh, but uh, in the end, uh, it all works out. And this final step, adding the, adding the vegetation, uh, is done in Unreal Engine. And in total, the model the area is 46 square kilometers. Uh, more than 500 kilometers of uh, roads, not lanes, but roads here. Uh, 90,000 uh, trees, and so on. Uh, some small part of this uh, uh, digital twin is also available for, on our homepage. And I will show you a short video how it looks like. Uh, this is uh, like a central part of Tartu. We're still a little bit uh, working with uh, uh, the, uh, the brightness of the textures. Uh, it's a little bit off, but... Uh, but it's usable already. And you can also experience this uh, in, uh, in the expo area. There is a rally chair. You can sit down and drive around in this city. But the goal uh, is not so much to, to create this uh, virtual city. Uh, the goal is to test the autonomous car software uh, in this simulation. And here you see uh, the autonomous car uh, driving around in Tartu. This is the city center part, which we have modeled a little bit more in detail. Uh, and here you see what the autonomous car sees, uh, how it plans its uh, um, <coughs> path. Uh, there are some obstacles along the way. This uh, yellow uh, wall shows uh, that there is an um, obstacle that is uh, driving ahead. Uh, and then it stops for the traffic light and so on. So we create a scenarios in the simulation, and we play through those uh, scenarios in the simulation to, to validate that the car behaves the way it should. And yeah, there are many ideas how to move forward from uh, here. For example, uh, query the Tartus uh, driving schools, what are the most challenging scenarios where they test the, the students in driving schools. Anyway, uh, to summarize, uh, the open, we used a lot of open data from OpenStreetMap, Estonia Landport, and Tartu City. 
and we used a number of open source uh, softwares. There's still two commercial softwares that we ended up using. Uh, one is the Roadrunner and the other one is Metashape. Maybe that's the, the like a future challenge for the open source community to come up a replacement for, uh, for those. And uh, in the end, we want to make Tartu the self-driving capital of Europe uh, because we have four seasons. Uh, people in California cannot enjoy that. So we can test the uh, vehicles in all four seasons. We have uh, agile lawmaking processes in Estonia. And we have the infrastructure in the form of uh, HD maps, simulation, and machine readable traffic lights, all validated by the autonomous driving lab. And that's basically all from me. And this work, of course, uh, was done uh, together with uh, collaborators, Edgar, who is also here, uh, Karl Johan, and uh, Allan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tambet. Very nice way to start the session and the day. The floor is open to questions. Uh, you mentioned only machine-readable traffic lights, but what about uh, other machine-readable uh, things, like pedestrian crossings, cr roundabouts? Uh, that's a very valid question. Uh, indeed, we have experimented uh, having stationary sensors. Uh, but what's usual for the self-driving cars is to have the sensors attached to the vehicle. Uh, but you could also have stationary sensors that sense, for example, if there is a car coming from this direction. And maybe there is some kind of corner so that the self-driving car itself cannot see behind the corner, but this stationary sensor can see there. So we have experimented with this, and uh, this is also one way how to overcome the shortcomings of the current sensor sets and how to uh, integrate uh, like the stationary sensors into the system. So indeed, yes, we are looking into that as well. So once you have the HD map uh, that represents the world in, in its best form, how do you handle when the world deviates? So when there's construction, when there's unexpected things? So there are many levels to this. Uh, firstly, uh, the local municipality keeps track of uh, all the road works. So we can uh, uh, and this is even, uh, even now, it's automated. We ha can have them notifying us that this part of the road is having roadworks. So uh, we can mark this part that not uh, routable. And uh, then once the roadworks uh, are finished, then we go map it again and, uh, and include it in our system again. The second part is if there is something unexpected, for example, uh, some crash or, or some unexpected works. Uh, then the way we see uh, it is that there is also a teleoperation fallback. There is a remote driver somewhere uh, that can take over the control of the vehicle. So when uh, there is any obstacle on the way of the vehicle, the vehicle stops and it waits there. And if the obstacle doesn't go away, then it signals the remote operator who takes control of the vehicle. And the remote uh, operator uh, helps the vehicle uh, through the situation and can optionally mark the part of the road as not routable. Uh, and that's how we see it working. Okay. Are you able to test for emergency situations in this simulation? Uh, I'm thinking maybe when the remote operator doesn't have or wouldn't have enough time to react or when the car would need to break certain traffic laws to avoid an accident, for example, crossing over lines or something. That's the main goal of the simulation, I, I would say, uh, because uh, there are many situations that are too dangerous to be tested in the real world. Uh, so you need a simulation to perform those tests. The troubling thing is that creating those scenarios uh, is still uh, quite a lot of work. Uh, somebody needs to do it. And, uh, and you're, you might be limited in your imagination what, uh, what scenarios you can come up with. Uh, so this is open area for research, uh, yet 
But yeah, I think uh, simulation is essential ex exactly for that reason. Okay, folks, we have to leave it there. I understand this is a very uh, interesting topic, so please approach Tambet during the coffee breaks, lunch break, etc. And we reconvene back here in one hour. Uh, sorry, on the top of the hour, not in one hour, so in five minutes. Thank you, Tambet. Thank you.